You know, I don't think we, we have uh, uh, the, the market cornered on how to set up an oilseed industry at all, but we, we do have some success. But I, I was just amazed at the similarities in our region that uh, uh, some trials and tribulations that we've been through and that you're going through here. It, uh, I would say I'm mystified about why uh, the oilseed industry in the non-traditional areas has had such a difficult time getting started, getting momentum. We started with canola in Kansas and Oklahoma in the late 80s and early 90s. We actually set up the Great Plains Canola Council, uh, but it went by the wayside because we never could uh, really get traction. We, we had so many issues, so many things going against us. Uh, first of all, there was nobody to buy it, and that's kind of sort of fundamental. It's kind of like you're probably not going to win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. And so we had nowhere to sell it. We didn't have winter-hardy varieties, and we didn't make a lot of progress. But uh, I remember being at a meeting with Dick Ald, who said if we would put some money into this, we could develop those varieties. And his name has come up a couple of times here today. And, and uh, someone else talked earlier about where the money, follow the money, where the money has been spent. It's on those high, higher dollar crops, corn and, and uh, uh, soybeans and cotton. And so, so few funds have been spent. I'm going to use the words uh, canola and oilseed synonymously, if you'll uh, indulge me there. Uh, but in the big picture, so little has been spent. Of course, I'm a firm believer that we need to be spending more, but we've got to convince some important people that that's true. I was prepared to tell you that we get really dry in the Great Plains, but I found out you get really dry up here. And just take a peek around and, and you figure that out. We certainly don't have as many rainfall belts as you have, or lack of rainfall belts maybe would be a better uh, description. You know where the Great, Fall, uh, Great Plains lies. It stretches all the way up past this region and on up into Canada. I'm going to focus uh, tonight briefly mostly on Kansas and Oklahoma. If you look at uh, yield limiting factors, those things that limit agronomic crops around the world, lack of water is at the top of the list. Water is the problem. Water is the solution. But we are limited in our, our methods for overcoming that problem. And we certainly live with that all the time in the Great Plains. And are we ever living with it right now? Uh, we're in a two and a half year drought right now and with no, no signs uh, of it breaking anytime soon. I was watching a weather report last night and back in December they said we'll be stuck here at least through February and now they're saying we'll be stuck here at least through April. And I think they're just being safe uh, there. But there's nothing rolling around up in the atmosphere that's going to kick something up and, and help us out. And we already have enough issues without that fact. Uh, I just uh, put this little uh, uh, schematic up to show uh, how we're surrounded by uh, high yield corn. But uh, there in northern Kansas, uh, they can grow some corn. Uh, but down in the heart of our growing areas, and I'm not going to talk about Nebraska tonight. Uh, you, you got a, quite a tutorial on that today, and, and, and quite an excellent one. Um, I, I certainly learned a lot, but I'm going to confine my remarks mostly to Kansas and Oklahoma. Anyway, we miss out on the corn and soybean area, so we uh, don't grow very much of that. Kansas more than we do in Oklahoma. You know, uh, you don't have to be much of a researcher to see just how few new crops we've added in the U.S. over the past 50 years. The, the list today looks virtually identical to the list from 50 years ago. They just don't come along very often. I remember there was a yearbook of agriculture about 20 or 25 years ago called uh, Living on a Few Acres. Now that might be of interest to our urban cousins, but it's not of interest to the people in this group. Uh, one, one farmer, one prominent wheat farmer one time was listening to our, our uh, I'm, I'm, probably, I'm sorry, cotton farmer, was listening to our cotton breeder talking about uh, incremental gains in yield. 
And he was very proud that he had released a variety that was going to incrementally be better than what they had had before. And with some very colorful language, this uh, cotton grower told the researcher, we are not interested in increments, we're interested in multiples. Well, we don't get multiples very often. But if there's anything that has come along, and since I've been working in agronomy for 40 years, 40 plus years, it's canola. It, it is something that it happens very rarely. So we're pretty excited about it down our way. You know that we grow an awful lot of wheat um, and have for a, a long, long time. Uh, someone asked if we rotate wheat, and I said yes. Every 50 years, they, they put in something else. Lots of wheat, but you also grow a lot of wheat up in this area, of course. And that went right by, but you know, you know where the wheat is. But our wheat acreage has been dropping, and not necessarily because we're replacing it with something else, but because our yields are dropping. As uh, Bob said, uh, we've gotten more arid, and we, we are in wheat because that's what we do to overcome the dry conditions. We, we've tried soybeans, and we've tried corn. And we can grow those in some years, and we can grow them very well in good years. But over the long haul, it's a, it's a, it's a hard road to hoe. So we've grown and still grow a lot of wheat. The buffalo slide was just to wake you up. <laughs> and we grow what a lot of folks refer to as wheat only, not, not in rotation, not in double cropping. We have some double crop in the eastern part of the state, but most of our wheat is not double cropped. It is wheat only. And if, uh, if there's been anything that has been amplified, any point that's been amplified in spades today, it is the benefits of rotation. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to skip right over that part. But we grow a lot of wheat down in our country because historically growers have gotten what they would uh, think of as acceptable yields with low risk. But when I think about 30 bushel wheat yields and I read that in uh, one of your counties here in uh, Washington and one over in Idaho that the average yields are 82, 83 bushel per acre, uh, that's pretty astonishing. So we certainly know we're nowhere near the yield potential, but we have some, some limitations. Now, we're a little bit, uh, I might even use the word addicted to wheat. Uh, certainly we have been over the past five decades. Uh, but we're trying to get rehabilitated. And the rehab we're trying to go through is to get more people interested in canola. Uh, earlier today, Dr. Tom Peeper's name was mentioned. Tom was a uh, weed scientist, but always was interested in uh, uh, things around the periphery. And he did a tremendous amount with uh, chemical weed control and small grains over the years. Concluded that we were never going to get those problems solved strictly with chemical methods. And a number of years ago began to look for rotation crops that would provide that uh, respite from continuous wheat uh, where we could control those weeds in, in a, in a non-grass crop in a better way. And he tried a lot of different things. But he really didn't have a lot of success until he hit on canola about a decade ago. And we have learned with a lot of starts and stops, successes and some failures, that canola is a good option for us. Bob talked about the fact that uh, not only can we expect, and mostly this is anecdotal, 15 to 20 percent yield increases, it's not uncommon for folks to get a 50% yield increase. And we have a tremendous problem with foreign material in our wheat down in the Great Plains. Uh, lots of threats about what's going to happen if we don't get it cleaned up. Folks are eventually motivated to do something like that when it, when it hits them in the pocketbook. And we're there now. Now I'm going to mention briefly four requirements that I see that are essential for establishing an oilseed crop, uh, an oilseed industry. Some of you may conclude that there are others, 
But I don't think that there can be any argument about uh, the validity of these four being a part of the mix. First of all, there has to be a demand for that product. Someone has to want to use it. Growers have to be able to produce it. By the way, these are extremely obvious. There has to be a way to get it out the farm gate and into a, a system. And then finally, what I'm most concerned about is profitability for the grower, but everywhere along the chain, folks have to make some money. It has to be profitable. We've only skimmed the surface with canola. We're growing about a million and a half acres in the country, in the U.S. each year, which pales compared to the big four. And I don't know where we will ever rank on that chart uh, or ever move up into that rarefied air, probably not. But we don't need to for this to be a really good thing for the U.S., not just for the Great Plains, but for the U.S. You can barely see that little green bar there uh, compared to what I'll call the big four, about a million and a half acres. The right-hand graph shows the year-to-year -year, uh, variance in uh, plantings of canola. That occurs depending on the weather, primarily in North Dakota. If it's a really good year, they plant about a million and a half acres. If they get hit by uh, wet weather, uh, which is usually the issue, then they may go down to 800,000 acres or a million acres. Uh, so there is a lot of variability. Now, one of the things that uh, they tout in North Dakota, and you have somewhat of a similar situation here. In North Dakota, they, they say they have seven program crops. I ask how many you have here. I, I don't think seven were identified, but it's a heck of a lot more than we have down our way. So we're even more excited about the possibility of canola there. Uh, this slide probably is a little bit light, but focus. And if you do, you will see that uh, there's a little yellow area down in the Great Plains there on the Kansas-Oklahoma line, and then a er uh, yellow area up in this country. But again, they pale, no pun intended, compared to that huge dark yellow area in Canada and northern North Dakota. I pulled some, uh, some statistics. I tell you, it was deep research, but uh, you'd see right through that. Canada grows about 20 million acres a year, give or take. They're proud of the fact that uh, they employ 50,000 or 50,000 growers produce this crop, over almost a quarter million jobs. It's a $15 billion industry, 85% of which is exported, with the biggest buyer of the oil and meal, the U.S. Some whole stuff goes overseas, but we're being way too kind to our northern neighbors. And we need to keep a lot more of those dollars here south of the border, south of the northern border. And, and there aren't a lot of reasons why we don't, why we aren't doing that. Um, at least not down in our country. And yet again, it has been a tough nut to crack to, uh, uh, to, to accelerate the acceptance and the growing of this crop. Now we're growing, let's for common uh, uh, site picture, we're growing about a million and a half acres a year, but we need four and a half million acres worth. Now that's a whole lot of uh, a crop before we hit that glass ceiling. And who knows what it might be if we start making advances. I, I don't think we're limited to what we're using now. There is growing emphasis every day on using healthy oils. And at the top of that list is canola. It is not a niche crop. I like to use the term uh, cut dried flowers. This is not cut dried flowers. This is something we can sink our teeth into. And uh, that's why we're excited. You've seen this picture ad nauseum. Uh, but don't forget that the emphasis on healthy oils, whether people do all the things they should be doing or not, notwithstanding, you're, we're going to see more and more emphasis on healthy oils. And again, canola is right there at the top. Nothing is easy in farming. And the road to 
establishing a, an oil seed industry or getting into canola growing in a successful way, it's a, uh, it's a, a road that's uh, littered with uh, obstacles and starts and stops. I think I've already used that term, but it is not easy. If it were easy, we would have done it 20 years ago. If it were easy, we would have done it a decade ago. But we are going to get this done, I think, by working together. My second and, I think, last list of the night, and that's uh, what does it take to produce this crop? And I've identified five key factors. Again, you may think of others, but this is my list, so you can um, add to it uh, at your own discretion. Of course, there, we have to grow the crop, and there are a lot of parts uh, to that. Um, have to have some technical support. Somebody has to support those new growers and provide expert advice as that technology is being transferred to the grower level. Research is the lifeblood of new technology. We have far too little of it going on. Being a product of extension, I have to put in a plug there, role of extension is changing. It's changed dramatically from when I started in extension 40 years ago. Maybe it was time, but so, so much of the role that extension filled in the past is either now being fulfilled by industry itself or not being done at all. But I don't see that being reversed as university budgets are constantly being reduced and challenged. And so we better find a way to obtain these services in other ways because they are not going to come in the traditional ways, so to speak. I think if, uh, if I make any important pertinent points tonight, it's the importance of a growers association, a strong growers association that folks buy into, and an oil seed commission. Both of these have been extremely important in the establishment of the oil seed industry in the Great Plains. Now, most of you are familiar with the technology adoption curve, uh, probably far uh, more knowledgeable about it perhaps than I am. But not everything, uh, an industry is, is certainly not, it doesn't come into existence on an even pace. There will always be some innovators, there will always be some early adopters, and then you get the early majority. And then later on, you'll have some other folks come along. Very fortunately, and I've already mentioned uh, Dr. Pieper, I would put him in the motivator class. I made that one up, but uh, you're free to use it if you choose. And then uh, Jeff Scott, who spoke with you last year. And Jeff is both motivator and innovator. And uh, I'm not sure where we would be in, with a, an oil seed industry in our country without uh, either or both of these guys. And then you heard from Bob uh, Schrock today, and I certainly would say that Bob is an innovator. And then we have had been very fortunate to have some early adopters in both Oklahoma and Kansas. So, so important. Uh, guys who are uh, respected in their communities, that others watch what they're doing, respected and admired. You have those people here. I know some of them by name. And uh, they're so fundamental to any success that we're going to have wherever we're trying to establish a new industry. And then there will be the late majority and finally the laggards, those who may finally jump aboard but will do so uh, uh, quite late. And then technical support. Last year, uh, uh, Heath Sanders from uh, Producers Cotton Producers Cooperative Oil Mill, they handle a lot of cotton, so I always uh, start there. Uh, Heath came up and spoke with you. Heath has been such a tremendous asset to the Oklahoma growers. He is a, a blue collar guy with white collar knowledge, and he's out there helping those growers get themselves established. We have done a, a lot with extension, and you've got Karen who has done a lot of work with you here. You have tremendous assets here in Washington. Uh, there is nothing unique about this little segment of my talk, but to establish a new industry, you've got to make this knowledge available. And, and we, like other regions, like you do here, just look around at these posters, uh, try to share that and try to transfer that technology, those new ideas and, and plans and possibilities to, uh, to the growers. And then we're 
of course, doing the obligatory educational work. Uh, we've had a program down there for several years now called Canola U. Our, our industry sponsors have uh, decided they don't want to spend that much money on it. So we're replacing that with a program we're calling Canola College. It will be sponsored by Great Plains Canola Association in cooperation with uh, Oklahoma State University and uh, Kansas State University. Um, one of the things that came, um, not came, but is brutally clear about canola compared to the other crops we try to grow is that it is, I used to be a field artillery officer in a, in a former life, and there's technology, old technology called fire and forget. Canola is not a fire and forget crop. It, it takes management, but for those who want to make it work, they certainly can. I've already said that research is the lifeblood of new technology. Uh, the right hand picture here is our most recent oilseed research report that was sponsored by the Oilseed Commission and by GPCA. We formed, or the, I wasn't there at the time, but GPCA was formed in 2007. Uh, the leaders understood that if they were going to make much progress, they had to invest themselves in this. I like to call this a self-help organization. It's an investment organization. It is not a cost, it's an investment. And uh, you have to invest if you want this crop or any crop to work for you. And this is just part of one of the, the things you do to make it work. Our GPCA is absolutely made up of all segments of the industry. That's why it got off the ground, but we're very proud to say that it is grower-led. And industry has worked very closely with us on that, not only as accepting of that fact, but endorses it. And we promote, but we promote the whole canola industry. Some of the things we do there, you can imagine what they are. And this is the area in which we work. You know what the Great Plains states are. Uh, the Great Plains region doesn't quite cover all of those. It gets awfully close to you folks up here. But again, as I've already mentioned, we are focusing primarily on Oklahoma and Kansas. We're trying to initiate some work in uh, eastern Colorado and in the Texas Panhandle. In the last decade, we have, through GPCA, and I, I'm positive this would not have happened, we've been able to raise more than a million dollars in research funds for canola work. A lot of that was USDA money, but if you don't have folks pushing, you don't, uh, they don't grease wheels if, if they're not uh, squeaking. And so we, we believe our Growers Association has played a great role in that. And I don't know how much you know about the U.S. Canola Association, but they have been tremendous partners for us in our uh, operations in the, in the Great Plains, and I, I've spoken to Karen about that, and she's certainly on board, but you certainly need to reach out to them. I would describe it as uh, they're the third leg on the three-legged stool, and we wouldn't be where we were, where we are, without their help. And then we're very fortunate to have a very proactive oil seed commission in Oklahoma. Kansas does not have an oil seed commission at this time. It was created in 2008. As you would imagine, it's to grow the industry. I think enough said about that. And to fund research. We expect as we start uh, bringing in more money from the volunteer checkoff assessment that we'll have a lot more research money to work with. But this year, uh, their fund, uh, the OC Commission funded $65,000 worth of research there with the state land grant university. And we think it will be much more than that in the future. It also, not surprisingly, is producer-led. So there is, without question, uh, strong linkage between our growers and the Oil Seed Commission in our state and the Great Plains Canola Association in both of the states. And then marketing. Got to have a way to get that crop out the farm gate, first purchasers, and the processors. Our first purchasers until a year ago were almost exclusively the processors who invested in this to uh, move the industry along. 
Um, I heard earlier today you were talking about who buys your canola in one of the sessions, the different elevators. That was a very slow and maybe even could be said painful process down our way to get the elevators engaged. They're a lot like the producers. They're addicted to wheat, and they did not want to have to deal with this new and different crop and all that that would mean, setting uh, silos aside, handling those sorts of things. And they certainly didn't want the competition of having to handle canola and wheat at the same time. Now, we've made the best crop we've made since we've been growing canola this past year. And there was an awful lot of grinching and concern about uh, whether they would continue to accept the canola after the wheat began to be brought to market. Fortunately, the canola was all marketed, th that that was going to be, before the wheat started coming off. So there is a little bit of time differential between the two crops, and that was a very fortunate thing. And as long as that happens, they will, uh, I wouldn't say enthusiastically handle it, but they will handle it. When they have to make a choice, uh, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. Uh, I pretty much made these points already. Local purchasing was very slow to start. The elevators had to be convinced, and, and that's still a very recent thing. Their attitude was wheat first. But in 2012, we did have 12 first purchasers of canola in Oklahoma, some less than that in Kansas, but a lot of, their, a lot of the Kansas canola is marketed in Oklahoma. That's 12 separate companies. We had more buying points than that. So from zero uh, to 12 companies, we feel pretty good. We feel like that's success. Can't say enough good things about the participation and the cooperation of the processors in getting this industry going down our way would never have gotten off the ground or to this point where we are now without their particular, uh, particularly aggressive action. Uh, they were the first purchasers, not so much now because we have others out there who are doing that, but uh, kudos to them. And then profitability. It's one thing to talk about the uh, important qualities of this, this oil, and we should all be proud of that, and I certainly am, but unless the grower's making some money, doesn't mean a thing. And uh, you know that in spades. Being unique is uh, maybe interesting, uh, but unique doesn't put money in the, in the wallet of the growers. It's gotta be uh, not only unique, it's gotta be useful, and it has to be profitable and down our way, canola certainly is. And I would just say do the math, and you've had a lot of math done for you today, far more complicated what, than what I'm showing you here, but uh, 40 bushels of each of these crops, or either of these crops, wheat was about $8 this year per bushel, canola was $12.50, uh, even I can do the math that that's a pretty good differential. If you look at, uh, a higher yield for the wheat and uh, even a lower yield for the canola, the advantage, even with some additional input cost, still comes out strongly in favor of the canola. Demand, production, market, profitability, any of those links in the chain not there, you cannot grow this industry. Growers, technical assistance, research, the linkage between the organizations that support our industry, first purchasers and processors, every single one of these are a critical link in the chain. I, I can't, uh, I'm not certain that I know exactly where your weak links are. I'm, I'm very excited about your possibilities though. I think you have a great start on every single one of these, even if you don't have it fully developed. So I am not, I've not had the pleasure of going out and seeing the Palouse, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, been kind of educated by slides. I'm actually anxious to go out and feel that soil myself and see what it looks like. But can you visualize a time when some of that wheat, a lot of that wheat on the Palouse is replaced by that brilliant yellow flowering crop that um, has all of us so excited? Uh, do we have any water beneath the ground that we can pump? Y you know, uh, one of the things that is particularly of interest out in western Kansas is trying to grow canola on, on limited water. 
uh, because as the water table or water availability dwindles, that's corn country out there. The question is, are growers going to be willing to accept what they can get with any water? It certainly has the potential to, to do well with some water. You don't need nearly as much as you do with uh, corn. So from that standpoint, it's pretty exciting. It's whether the growers will, whether the growers will think it is or not. Yeah, uh, did you hear the question? If the first purchasers were, uh, if the uh, processors were the first purchasers, they contracted on a fee basis with elevators. They had select sites that they were able to convince to handle as a pass-through. Uh, generally, those elevators never owned it. They simply paid them a fee for uh, uh, accepting it and, and passing it on through. Now, uh, ADM has gone a step further. They uh, have done the bagging and are bypassing in some cases, which you know, there's always a political element here, and I won't say too much more about that. But they've been advocates of the bagging system where they're dealing directly with the grower. If you saw that presentation earlier today, they bring the bags and they bring the trucks and they haul it. It never goes to an elevator. But I've always found that money is a powerful motivator. And if the elevators can make some money, they'll be interested. Okay, thanks very much.